More than any other president, Obama has prosecuted truth-tellers known as whistleblowers. And this is WikiLeaks, an internet whistleblowing organization. Independent and stateless, it represents a landmark in journalism. WikiLeaks has released hundreds of thousands of secret Pentagon documents that describe the wholesale killing of civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan. In the information that you have revealed on WikiLeaks about these so-called endless wars, what has come out of them? Looking at the enormous quantity and diversity of these military or intelligence apparatus insider documents, um, what I see is a, a vast, sprawling um, estate, what we would traditionally call the military intelligence complex or military industrial complex, and that this sprawling um, industrial estate um, is growing, becoming more and more secretive, becoming more and more uncontrolled. This is not um, a sophisticated conspiracy controlled at the top. This is a, a vast movement of self-interest yeah. by thousands and thousands of players uh, all working together uh, and against each other to produce a, an end result, which is Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, Colombia and, and keeping that going. You know, we often deal with tax havens and people hiding assets and transferring money are through offshore tax havens. So I see some really quite remarkable similarities. Guantanamo is used for laundering people to an offshore haven which doesn't follow the rule of law. Similarly, Iraq and Afghanistan and Colombia are used to wash money out of the US, US tax base and back. Arms companies. Arms companies, yeah. I mean, what you're saying is that money and money making is at the centre of modern war and it's almost self-perpetuating. Yes, and, and it's becoming worse. What happens when WikiLeaks runs into the United Kingdom, which has some of the most draconian secrecy laws in the world, such as the Official Secrets Act? We haven't found a, a problem publishing uh, UK information. I mean, when we look at the Official Secrets Act label documents, um, we see they state that it is an offence to retain the information and it is an offence to destroy the information. So the only possible outcome is that we have to publish the information. <laughs> Um, and that's what which we have done on, on many, many occasions. I, I noticed one that I uh, had a, a personal interest in was one that uh, from the Ministry of Defence classified document that um, equated uh, terrorists with investigative journalists as threats. And Russian spies. And Russian spies. Yeah, as, as in fact in many sections of that report, investigative journalists are the number one uh, threat to the sort of information security. Uh, of the Minist Ministry of Defence. That was a 2,000-page a document on how to stop leaks uh, from the Ministry of Defence, which, which we leaked. I didn't know whether to be uh, offended or honoured. Well, um, it's ni nice to be having a, an, an impact. <laughs> Since the release of the Pentagon's war secrets, Julian Assange has been subjected to extraordinary smears and accusations originating in America and Sweden. These include threats against his life and bizarre character assassination. The media all over the world has amplified this propaganda. This secret Pentagon document states clearly that US intelligence intends to destroy trust in WikiLeaks by threatening whistleblowers with exposure and criminal prosecution, thereby discrediting truth-tellers. How you feel about whistleblowers as an essential part of democracy? Do you, do you approve of whistleblowers? Well, I think, uh, you know, this country has laws to protect 
whistleblowers. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and I think that uh, you know th there have been instances in our history where uh, shining a light on something is is important to do. Can you, as a senior official? Uh, of the United States government a guarantee that the editors of WikiLeaks and the editor himself is not American are not in danger, that they themselves will not be subjected to the kind of hunt that we read about in the, the media? Well, first of all, it's not my position to give guarantees on anything. We do have an open uh, criminal investigation. The investigation is targeted on the individuals that have um, uh, violated the trust and confidence that's been mm. bestowed upon them by this country. But WikiLeaks is an organization run from outside the United States, and the founder of that has been told that he is at great risk from being hunted down. I don't know in what form. And neither do I, so I'm, I'm afraid I can't help you. I mean, for you to receive that volume of documentation, suggests that there must be something of a rebellion going on within the system. Yes. I mean, it's the one hopeful thing is, in fact, that there are good people in the US military, and some of those people have had enough. It's sort of another way of being a conscientious objector, and, in fact, um, arguably a far more powerful way of objecting uh, yeah. to the war. In April 2010, WikiLeaks released this cockpit video from an Apache gunship in Baghdad in 2007. The gunship is firing from a distance of over a mile from its victims. This is the war you don't see. Clearly, there were two cameramen there holding cameras, not arms. Um, these cameramen turned out to be Reuters news reporters. I haven't seen anything since then. Just fucking, once you get on, just open them up. Yeah, Roger, I, um, I, I see your element, you got uh, about four Humvees uh, out along this... Uh, You're clear. Uh, All right, firing. Line here, when the state line, uh, let me know when you have yeah, it. What shoot. Light them all up. Come on, fire. Hey, Roger. Keep shooting. We need to move time now. All right, we just engaged all eight individuals. A whole street covered with bodies. The reaction to that was nice. Yeah, look at those dead bastards. Nice. Two six, crazy horse one eight. This tape for me and the other people involved made nice a dirty word. So we just couldn't see something has been nice anymore when a whole street uh, covered with carnage uh, is nice. Ethan McCord was one of the first soldiers to reach the scene of the killing. Here he speaks to an audience in the United States. Myself and the team of soldiers I was with began running in the direction where we heard the Apache fire. Let's shoot. Thank you. I was not even close to prepared for the carnage that I was about to walk onto. I saw what appeared to have been three men on a corner. Got that big pile of bodies to the right on the corner. Right we got dismounted infantry and vehicles. Over. It was an extreme shock to my system. They didn't look human. Then there was the smell. The smell was un unlike anything I've smelled before. A mixture of feces, urine, blood, smoke, and something else indescribable. Now, Bushmaster, we have a van that's approaching and picking up the bodies. Request permission to engage. Bushmaster 7, Roger. This is Bushmaster 7, Roger. Engage. 1-8, engage. Clear. Come on. Clear. Clear left. Oh, yeah, look at that. Right through the windshield. <laughs> 208 for soft four. We call frequency. I yeah, just drove over a body. Yeah. <laughs> Crying. I hear crying, not cries of pain, but that of a small child who had just woken up from a horrible nightmare. Yeah, it looks like we got I saw that there was a minivan 
and the cries appeared to be coming from it. Myself and another soldier, a 20-year-old private, walked up to the passenger side van and looked inside. The private that I was with reeled back, began to vomit, and quickly ran away. What I saw when I looked in the van was a small girl about four years old on the passenger side of the bench seat. She had a severe belly wound and was covered in glass. Roger, we need, we need a, uh, to evac this child. Uh, she's got a wound in the belly. The glass was in her hair and also in her eyes. Next to her, half on the floorboard, with his head resting on the seat, was a boy about seven years old. He wasn't moving, and from the severe wound to the right side of his head, my first thought was that he was dead. In the driver's seat was who I immediately concluded must have been these children's father by the way he was hunched over the children in a protective manner. The whole time thinking, fuck, what the fuck, these are babies. Hey, uh, I need to get the, rat, the brass to drop ramps. I got a wounded girl, we need to take the rest of my ass. Oh, it's their fault for bringing their kids to a battle. That's right. See, my son was born May 31st, 2007. I had yet to see him. And I had a daughter who was barely older than this girl. The medic radioed in that the little girl needed to be evacuated because there was nothing else he can do here. I handed the child to the medic who then ran the girl to a waiting Bradley armored vehicle. I walked back to the van. I don't know why. I looked inside the van again. Did the boy just move? Holy shit, the boy just moved. I grabbed the boy from the van and held him against my chest. I was screaming at this point, the boy's alive, the boy's alive. I started running to the Bradley in hopes that it wasn't leaving. At this point, the boy looked up at me. Then his eyes rolled back and my heart sunk. It's okay, I have you. It's going to be okay, don't die, don't die. I squeezed him a little bit tighter. I put him into the Bradley as gently as I could. Did you tell uh, Battalion that two civilian children casualties are coming back to rest of my and the Bradley over? Roger, that's a uh, negative on, on uh, evac and the uh, two uh, civilian uh, kids to uh, Rusty. They're going to have uh, the you know, IPs will take them up to a local hospital over. What the fuck are you doing, McCord? It was my platoon leader. You need to quit worrying about these fucking kids and pull security, he screamed. At the time, the only thing I can think of was, Roger that, sir. One of the soldiers on the ground, he describes the atrocity as, and I quote him, an everyday occurrence. And he said the word from his commander was to kill, I won't use the word, everyone on the street. And he replied to him, are you kidding me, women and children? He said, yes. And it's a point made by many other soldiers who've come back from Afghanistan and Iraq, that this kind of atrocity is not an aberration. Well, first of all, 